So Kumi, we're one week into the, the COP17 here in Durban. How are you feeling so far? Well, uh, not very optimistic. We appear to be, as usual, going nowhere slowly. And uh, bottom line is there isn't the sense of urgency, the sense of ambition uh, in the uh, negotiation process that the world needs. Uh, I believe that our political leaders are sleepwalking us into a crisis of epic proportions and they're playing political poker with the future of this planet. And I hope that now today with the arrival of the ministers and with the uh, pressure that is seeing on the streets here in this march and so on, that maybe we can get some uh, movement forward in the next um, week so that this is not just another waste of space and carbon and so on. The, if this Durban becomes a burial ground of Kyoto, it will be a completely devastating blow to developing countries and their aspirations. If we do not get a clear foundation with a fast timeline for a fair, ambitious, legally binding treaty, that will be another betrayal. But importantly, we need to get movement on money to ensure that the Green Climate Fund has the level of investment that will help poor countries now cope with uh, climate impacts. We need to remind ourselves that it's not as if climate change is going to uh, impact with us in the future. People are losing their lives now. We are losing about 300,000 people annually from climatic impacts now. So we need to really move in terms of the urgency. We really need to move uh, to ensure that in fact uh, these negotiations actually uh, deliver something of substance. So. I think with regard to the US, which has been a, a blocker historically, uh, I think what we would say is we'd love the US to be part of a global pact moving forward, but if the US wants to block, 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 we would call on other nations of the world to move forward without the US and marginalize them if necessary. You've been inside the negotiations for the past week. How is it different being out here today? Well, yeah, people get it. The sense of reality, the sanity. I mean, they're inside, it's like business as usual, sadly. Uh, you know, people are debating about commas and apostrophes and uh, brackets on minutiae, when in fact what is needed is for us to recognize that time is running out. The sign says emissions must peak by 2015 and start coming down. We're three years away from 2015, right? I mean, we are selling our children's future down the toilet here. So I have make no apologies that I think these negotiations are stuck, that they have to be given a, a boost, and I hope that the pressures from the streets will actually contribute to getting some momentum going. But I fear that the negotiating positions that countries like Russia, Japan, uh, Canada, the US have come here with are so backward and so self-serving that in fact we probably, if things continue the way they are, it's unlikely that we will actually get a decent outcome from Durban. Who are the key countries to watch next week? Who can make a breakthrough? I think the key, I think one thing is to watch is whether the EU and China and basic countries are able to come together with a joint package that they can push for jointly, which seems to be one of the biggest hopes. The second country to watch as always is Ch US and how much it's blocking progress. Uh, and then on Kyoto, the key countries to watch are because Russia, Japan and Canada have explicitly said they plan to kill the treaty here. And we hope that uh, what they say and do next week, in the early weeks, will give you a good indication of whether in fact the treaty will, uh, Kyoto will actually survive this COP here in Devon. We've heard a lot about the importance of activism and encouraging governments to act. You're, you're a veteran activist, a veteran of one of the greatest struggles uh, in the history of recent times. What can we learn from recent human rights actions that the climate movement can take on board? Yeah, I think recent and historical um, historically and presently what history teaches us is that struggles for justice only go forward when decent and ma men and women say enough is enough and no more we prepare to go to prison if necessary we prepare to put our lives in the night lives is necessary and we're seeing that the people in the Arab Spring have shown us the people in uh, the Occupy movement are showing that and I think that we have to recognize that the biggest struggle that all 
all of humanity faces is the threats of global warming and climate change. And I hope that those of us who are in leadership will step forward and encourage other people to actually engage in peaceful but active non-violent direct action and civil disobedience because I think that's what is missing. Politicians and business leaders seem to have the same medical problem. They all struggle to hear. I think the hearing abilities will be announced by peaceful but strong and creative uh, civil disobedience and non-violent direct action. Thank you Kumi. Thank you.